Welcome to the Mount Sinai Missionary Baptist Church of Memphis Incorporated YouTube channel. Thank you so much for joining us today. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for keeping us, guiding us, and using us in your service. Please help us to pay close attention to learning the process of temptation, how it works. In Jesus' powerful name we pray. Amen. Uh, our text for today is found in the book of Genesis chapter 3, verses 6. Chap Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. That reads, uh, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. That's the English Standard Version of Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. Our subject for today is how temptation works. How temptation works. The process that goes uh, from beginning to end of our temptation by Satan. Now, I ask that you would ask the Holy Spirit to clear your minds so that you can... Can, so, so that uh, God can speak directly to you. And then submit to the Holy Spirit so that he can usher you, me, all of us into God's presence so that he can eliminate and enlighten our hearts for devotion to our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, uh, temptation go, has a process from beginning to end. Uh, I remember when I worked at Procter and Gamble, they uh, making uh, Pringle potato chips had a process from beginning to end, from uh, the dough to rolling it out to cutting the chips to salting the chips to canning the chips to carrying the chips in the can to the warehouse to be picked up and distributed throughout the United States and the world. Uh, everything has a process. Life itself is a process. So we're going to look at the process of temptation to learn how it works. The first thing we're going to look at is the human soul is often tempted by a desperate foe of unusual subtlety. Again, the human soul is often tempted by a desperate foe of unusual subtlety. That's Satan. Genesis chapter 3 verse 7 says, Then the eyes of both were open, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Now Satan is after what belongs to God. That's what he's trying to get. I, I just had this thought of uh, how uh, pastors should always stop. We should never fish in another pastor's fish tank. In other words, what I'm saying is we should go after the loss. Somebody that doesn't belong to anybody. Unless it's Satan. And then try and get them into the church. Don't go to other people's churches trying to get their members into your congregation. So Satan is always after what belongs to God. Satan was after uh, Job, who belonged to God, and was instructed by God himself that he could, could uh, touch everything that belonged to Job, but his soul, that belonged to God, and everything else too. But God, God has a right to uh, set parameters. Uh, God knew that the tempter of the human soul is subtle. Satan's work, malignant or deadly and cancerous, and it spreads from head to foot and from soul to soul. It's filled with the evil desires of one who is completely evil. 
Satan's ideas that infiltrate the mind is courageous. It's bold. And it's also foolish. Because his desire is to replace God in our lives. And God said that beside him, there is none other. A second thing that uh, temptation does, the way it works is, the tempter seeks to engage the human soul in conversation and controversy. The temptation seeks, the tempter rather, seeks to engage the human soul in conversation and controversy. Blessed the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Satan seeks to hold controversy with the human soul, that he may render us in a hurry to throw the moral restrictions of life off. What's the verse that says, uh, uh, man, that, 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 that uh, we throw off? We, we are looking for an opportunity to, the interpretation of the, the verses, we are looking, the human race is looking for an opportunity to quickly throw off the restrictions of life. In other words, the, 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 the restrictions that God places on us for our betterment. Satan, uh, Satan wants to awaken within our thoughts a derogatory character towards God. Satan wants us to think that, and I said last week, that, that Satan is trying to get us to think that God is trying to hold something back from us. Satan wants us to, 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 to believe or Satan tries to lead us to yield to the lust of the eyes. Satan tries to lead us to yield to the lust of the eyes. And, 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 and you have to be careful what you look at, especially too long. Some things we don't have any business looking at. I try to make it a habit of looking at what's mine. And then uh, use a method that my son, my youngest son told, told me about was bouncing my eyes away from what is not good or what does not, is not mine. The next thing that the tempter seeks to do is to make our souls his partner in the subduction of others. The tempter, Satan, seeks to make our souls his partner in the subduction of others. Satan deceived Eve and continued with his devilish work on her husband. Eve became subtle as her new master was and sought to change things uh, for what she believed to be better than God's way. That's what Satan is out to do. The unexpected result was not better, but much worse. She lost fellowship with her creator and her caretaker, Adam, who had been instructed by God to keep his creation in the condition it was created. God looked and saw it was good, and God wanted it to stay good. But Satan now uses Eve to join in to his work. The result of Satan's work also stopped Adam from taking care of, but Eve now sought 
to take over. And I'm just saying. And too often, that modus operandi continues to this day. The next thing is, the human soul soon wakes up from the subtle deception of temptation and finds that it has been deceived and ruined. Again, the human soul soon wakes up from the subtle deception of temptation and finds that it has been deceived and ruined. Again, verse 7 says, Then the eyes of both were opened, and they now know, or knew that they were naked. The human soul soon awakes from the charming vision of temptation. Satan always come to us with an idea that seems good to the soul. That's another form or, or definition for temptation. Making an idea seem good to the soul. Now, all of a sudden, the tree looked gigantic. The fruit looked rich and ripe. Mm, like a peach tree. And its color began to glow more and even more moment by moment. And then it's plucked and eaten. And then comes the bitter taste. The sad calling to mind. The moment of despair. What have I done now? To Adam and Eve, sin was a new experience. And no man is made any better for the bad experience of evil. The human soul awakening from the vision of temptation is conscious now of moral nakedness. Sin always brings shame and shame is felt deeply and cannot no matter how hard we try be hidden by any of our devices how sad the misery of a soul that has fallen from god the human soul Awakening from the vision of temptation is conscious of its moral nakedness and then seeks to provide clothing of its own making. Adam and Eve sewed fig leaves together to make them aprons. Sin must have a covering. It is often ingenious in making and sewing it together. But its covering is always unworthy and useless. Man cannot of himself clothe his soul. Only the righteousness of Christ can effectually hide our moral nakedness. Isaiah, in the 20th chapter of Isaiah, was assigned by God to give Israel an example of their nakedness. And he instructed Isaiah to go down to a, to a town, I think it was called Nump, and walk down the middle of Main Street, buck naked, as an example of how Israel was in putting their trust in anything and anybody but the true and living God. What can wash our sins away? What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. All precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. 
No other font I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my pardon, this I see. For my cleansing, this my plea. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for my sin atone. Not of good that I have done. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all of my hope and peace. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Glory, glory, this I sing. All my praise for this I bring. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. It was nothing I or you were able to do to make us whole and mend our brokenness in our lives or restore our relationship with our creator God. Only what Jesus did one Friday on an old rugged cross on a hill called Calvary, he, they, they nailed his hands to the cross. They drove a rivet through his feet and they thrust a spear through his side. For you and me, he died. They took him down and they buried him in a borrowed tomb. But early the third day morning, he rose from the dead with all power in heaven and in earth in his hand. And he's worthy of all the glory, honor, and praise that we can muster. He's worthy because it's the blood of Jesus at the foot of the cross where sinners plunge beneath and lose their guilty stain. Nothing but the blood of Jesus can make us whole. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for your living word. We ask now if you would enlighten our hearts so that we can better stand against the temptations of the devil. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. I pray that God's word will come alive in each of us and equip us to better do battle with Satan. And re remember, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The world was framed and and, and, and everything put into place by the word of God. And it's his word that we can stand on and find hope in days like this. So until next week, so long. Bye-bye.